you know, in their place. They can do all kinds of potions. And I have a vivid memory of a kindergartner. This was at school, but it was a kindergartner doing one, two, three, four, five, six. I mean, he was just all over the place, and I thought it was a boy. So I do want to stay in the places, but it was really cute. So you can do that kind of thing if you want to. All right, so let's count one more time, and you can move just a little bit with it if you want. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And my rule is that we freeze at the end. And that becomes a routine that the children can start with every week. I like at this point to start with an opening prayer of some kind or a scripture reading or for, for the children to share something they're thankful for for that week. So, already, would you tell me just a few reasons you're grateful and thankful to be here for the beginning of the Alleluia Conference? Safe journey. Safe journey. Amen. What New is? New music. New music. Yay. Good. You sing what you tune singing. <laughs> you know what? You, you, just, you just set things up because we're going to talk about that in this section. That's one of the things we're going to discuss. What are inspirations? So I say inspiration. inspiration. Yes. It's like a revival for musicians, isn't it? Excitement. Excitement. Yes. And great worship opportunities that we're going to have over the next few days. So welcome. I'm Julie Scott, and I'm the clinician for this session, and I'm doing one right after this. I think I'm doing like five tomorrow. I don't even know for sure. A lot, a lot of a lot of sessions tomorrow. And then also some on Thursday. So I hope to see a lot of you over the coming days. Um, the notes will be coming soon. Uh, I sent them to Jill last week and, and I understand from James, our assistant for this, that um, they have been printed and he's gone to look for them because we don't know exactly where they are. But that song and others that we're going to learn today are in, are in the notes. Okay? I have another song for you that is um, for the opening. And uh, one more thing, you're going to notice that I do the whole part whole method of teaching a song by rote. When I teach songs for little children, we do them usually mostly by rote. And any news on the notes? We're working on it. They're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be so busy, we have, don't have time to look at them right now anyway. So, meaning, I sing the whole thing, and then I'll break it down for you phrase by phrase. I listen to find out where the children are having trouble, if there's a place they're having trouble. We work on that, and then we put two phrases together, and then we put the whole thing together. Okay, it's just an efficient way to teach us on one The choir has begun, and we'll be having fun. I'm going to start that one more time. When you get to be my age, your voice doesn't always do what your brain tells it to. And I just sing like a minor triad. <laughs> the choir has begun, and we'll be having fun. Play along and sing along now, everyone. The choir has begun, the choir has begun, and we'll be having fun, and we'll be having fun. But then, 
Play along and sing along now, everyone. Here you go, baby. The choir has begun and we'll be having fun. Play along and sing along now, everyone. The choir has begun and we'll be having fun. Play along and sing along now, everyone. Good. Watch these motions. It's going to go like this.
actually take a second and introduce yourself to the person who's your new partner, find out where they're from and all that stuff. And but how many of you already know somebody in this room? I'm just checking. Well, now you probably know several people. <laughs> you know, as we were going through, I was saying, hi, but I only met half the people. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, and you know what? Let's do it once. The only thing is, I need to be, I need to be doing both. So, how can I solve this problem? But we either need one more person or we need one fewer person. Sue's going to be out. Sue, you want to play the drum with me? Sure. Okay. So here's what we'll do. I'll get drums with someone. And now find a new partner.
everybody on the outside of circle is going to come in a little bit later. So we're going to have a ring. The choir you has, the choir you has. We got it. Of the population. 
So most of children, a large majority of the children, can learn to match pitch. And that may not mean that they're going to learn how to match pitch at age five or age six, but it probably means that somewhere around seven, eight, nine, they're going to start matching pitch if they practice it. And we'll talk more about practice and what it can do in just a second. Um, well, first of all, I, I mentioned the reasons that they should find their head voice. Well, number one, I didn't even write this in here, but number one, because singing is a human activity that everybody should do. And also, it's something we do to praise God. It's one of, of many ways we worship is through our singing voice. So to have a singing voice that you can express yourself self through is really, really important. But also I wrote to avoid the harsh, possibly damaging singing voice that some of them may come in with. You know, the yelling that we hear so often in children's church choirs or children's choirs in general, um, because it sounds beautiful. And the main reason, just to know this, that some children don't match pitch is because they haven't found that place in their voices yet. I mentioned that a second ago. So that means they come in knowing how to talk, but they may not have sung yet. So when you sing, um, walk in the room and stand in a circle, you may get walk in the room and stand in a circle. And the first thing a lot of people think is, oh, that child doesn't hear the pitches. It might be that they hear it just fine. And if you ask, are you singing the same thing I'm singing? They may, well, first of all, they may so say yes are. because they may think you mean the words. <laughs> right? And just because it doesn't match the pitch, they, that may be so foreign to them at that point that they don't even know yet. So, but, but do their ears hear the difference? Probably so. Probably so. So, you know, that's one of the things we have to do is help them find that and learn how to match and understand what it means to match. Because if they're singing the same words, they may think that's matching. So they have to figure that out. Um, so I, I have a bunch of activities listed here. One of the things I do when the kids come in is to just vocalize a little bit. They might say this, if it, 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 you know, what, what time of the day do you have your, your church choirs? Six, 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 six. All right. So we might start by saying, "Good evening." Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hello. 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 Woo 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 So not only high and low, 
but also the difference between these voices, okay? So he used, this was his idea, the ABC song. How many of you know the ABC song? Most kids do by age five or six. So sing it for me, ready? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Okay, you got it. And let's say we sang through the whole thing, but you've got it. This time, I'm only going to use this word, which says what, everybody? Sing. Sing. And that's something you may need to work with them. If they're not reading yet, you may have to give them some word recognition or use pictures of some kind. Or put music notes out beside sing and a face with, you know, a mouth moving or something like that for speak. We're just going to use these two words. And when I point to this word, can somebody close the door, please? <laughs> the word is beautiful, but it's going to get yeah. So we're going to start here on A, B, C, D. And if I point to this word, we're going to go H, I, J, K. Okay? Would you, before we get started, would you say, repeat after me, this is my singing voice. 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 This is my speaking 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 voice. This is my singing voice. This is my singing voice. Good. So we'll do we'll these two. When I point to sing, you're going to sing. When I point to speak, you'll speak. Ready? A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Now I know my A, B, C's. Next time, won't you sing with me? Now, head teacher said before, oh, but can they not remember? when they come back in? Yes. I'm not going to stay on speak for a long, 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 long time, but they can. They do. They have good pitch memory. And somebody's got it, even if everybody doesn't. Okay, would you say, this is my speaking voice. This is my speaking voice. I'm gonna sing when the spirit says sing. 
I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. Does not everybody know that? <gasps> <coughs> How many of you don't know that? It's okay. The words were a little different. Really? Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's how I, that's how I've learned it. I, and that's your very. I can't remember. You can't. Okay. <laughs> okay. So sing that with us. You'll catch on so fast. Here we go, ready. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. I'm gonna sing when the Spirit says sing. And obey the Spirit of the Lord. I'm gonna speak when the Spirit says speak. I'm gonna speak when the Spirit says speak. I'm gonna speak when the Spirit says speak. singing patterns, hello boys and girls, hello Julie, those kinds of things that you've heard. And just know, I've had, I've had a lot of student teachers in my day, and, and I've observed young directors working with children's choirs too, and a lot of times what they think is, they'll say, match my pitch, ooh, match my pitch, ooh, and the kids are going like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> And one of the things to note, this is research-based also, it's easier for children to match two different pitches than it is for them to match one. And I think it's because there's differentiation. They can hear the difference. One pitch is tough. So instead of going, hello, everyone, you're going to go, hello, everyone, hello, everyone, and move it around and see if they can find it. Go high into the head voice if you can. All right. Um, here are a few more ideas. This is, these are just some ideas to help with children who are, having, who are still having trouble. First of all, I always say to the kids, you know what you should do if you're not matching pitch? Sing. And sing. And sing some more. How many of you were ever told as a child, don't sing? I'm glad. 
Because you know what? It's unusual for me to ask that question and not see at least one or two hands. And that just breaks my heart. You know, especially in church. It, you've, you've just got to be, you know, everybody needs to express themselves. You not, might not want to put the child in front of the microphone. Who's gonna, you, know, you might want to put them someplace between two strong singers. But, but that's, you know, that's some of the things, one of the things they need to do. And you're not going to learn, I always compare it to sports, you're not going to learn how to throw a ball by reading a book about it or by watching it done. You need to do it. And it's the same way with singing. They're learning how to use their vocal cords. And they can't learn how to use their vocal cords if they don't use their vocal cords. Okay? So the ones who are not matching pitch need to sing even more. They need to keep going. Okay? Another thing I found works, and this is not research-based, but I keep threatening to do this study. <laughs> I keep thinking I'm going to do it, but I haven't yet. And that is to make eye contact. I think there's a certain, I mean, this is just experience-based. So this is anecdotal. But I taught elementary music for 17 years, and I still work, and then I worked with children's choir much, many more years than that. And when we were standing together in a circle, there was a child who wasn't matching pitch. A lot of times, it was because they weren't paying attention. And so you'd go, um, hello, Sandy, and Sandy would sing, hello, Mrs. Scott, or hello, Miss Julie. And if she's not paying attention, I would say, Sandy, look at me. Hello, Sandy. Hello, Mrs. Scott. Or just Julie is fine. Okay? So she did it. And the thing is, I can't tell you how many times I've done that and it worked. A child, all they needed to do was pay attention. And then all of a sudden it was working. Um, another thing to do, and I think this has to do with attention too, is when there were kids who weren't matching pitch, a lot of times they're looking at the floor and they're looking around and they're just kind of singing like this, singing like this. And if I walk over to them and maybe get their eye contact, but also the proximity, just the fact that I'm standing closer to them, all of a sudden they pay attention and they're back on. <laughs> that, for me, was probably 35%, maybe 50% of the non-pitch matchers just weren't paying attention. That's how I felt. So once we got them, then we just have a few more that we have to work with. And so, uh, let's see. Another thing is to talk with them about it, and I, and I make it just something we talk about. Place them between strong singers, two strong singers. Um, instead of putting them on the end, you know, some, some people want to put the non-singers all over at the end. Where they need to be is someplace between the two people who are really matching pitch well. Because that sometimes does it too. When their peers are singing well, they want to do it too. So it might be peer pressure. Um, let's see. Yeah. It, sometimes when I have a child, I'll go to Barb this time. Barb, I'll bother you this time with it. But sometimes I'll have a child who is not matching pitch, and I'm doing individual singing. So I go, hello, Sandy. And she'd sing, hello. Oh, but sing on pitch. Oh, I thought I wasn't. <laughs> no, no, because okay. Barb's not going to sing on pitch. Oh, okay. <laughs> hello, Joe. Hello, Barb. Hello, Julie. Okay, good, good try, Barb. Was, were you matching pitch with me? Hello, Barb. Were you, on, were you singing it with me? You were? Okay, try one more time. Hello, Barb. Hello, Julie. Good, that was closer. Good job. Very nice. So sometimes I go to where they are, mm -hmm. and there's one other thing. I'll say, okay, this time all four of you sing together. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. And sometimes that's when Barb is on pitch and she gets with the whole group. And I don't want to focus on one child for too long, so I'll put them back with the, with the whole group. And I feel like they're not alone. Do everything you can to keep the child from being embarrassed. Being un unable to match pitch does not mean that you're not smart, and it does not mean that you're not good at music. I always, I'm not going to tell this story because of time, but I had a student named Charlie Gonzalez, who was my student in the skeet for um, three years. He was with me in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades. And in fourth grade, Charlie didn't match pitch. And I mean, he was a drummer. He had not learned to make his voice, his vocal cords work. That's when this whole thing started for me, was the, the, the thinking about it. Because here was the conundrum with Charlie. He didn't match pitch when he sang, but he played the recorder in tune. 
<laughs> okay? How many people really play the wood mortar in tune? Not too many. And when we learned something more on work instruments, he had it. He could get it immediately. He was the first one. I always put him on the base. Who's Dean? Is that, is it the camera? Maybe? I bet it's wrong. Now. Maybe that's what I'm uh, maybe it's done now. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, Charlie, uh, Charlie, I would put him on the bass part because I knew he would hold the part. He would never lose the part. He would get it. And when when he was in sixth grade, oh, in sixth grade he took band and orchestra. Hmm. And then in, in middle school he did summer PE so he could be in both band and orchestra. He played the tuba and he played the bass, the string bass. And in sixth grade, when his voice changed, he started matching pitch. All of a sudden, he could sing anything we could sing an octave lower. He just never found his head voice. Majored in music, went to Texas A&M Converse, and he's going to be a band director if he's working on it. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I'm Facebook friends with him. <laughs> and he's a little older, you know, he's like 26, I think, but he's finally going to get to do what he loves to do. All right. Um, and that's the main thing is just don't give up on them because they're going to be able to do it. Here's, here's something on the next page. I'm just going to go through some of these really fast so we can do at least one more activity before we leave. Sometimes that your parents say, I couldn't hear them. Have you heard that before? Yeah. I really couldn't hear them. <laughs> well, you've got a few different choices. One is if they're really little children, then have, instead of letting them sing in a great big sanctuary, let them sing for the parents in their room, you know, instead of singing in the big sanctuary. Or combine the little children's choir with another choir. Because you need more people if you can have So have a larger group. Well, I don't mean, you know, most people are going to say, well, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> I know you are. But, but what yeah, I mean by that is combine the groups together or use softer accompaniment. You know, I mean, you can do that, not, not use very loud accompaniment. Sing in a smaller room, that's really good for younger children. Or, last resort for me, use microphones. Because there aren't very many microphones that don't focus on, like, this child and that child. If the microphone's here, we're going to pick up those two voices. And we want to hear the whole group, if possible. So, it's tricky. Small children's choirs in a humongous congregation and a humongous sanctuary are really tough. So, I've never thought about it before, but couldn't the parents sit closer? Yes. <laughs> Tell them that if they want to hear, if they really want to hear, they need to sit closer. And they can bring their video camera with them. <laughs> All right. Um, telling children, I've heard it a million times, and it just it sends me into a frenzy. When you'll hear a choir director saying, louder, louder, sing louder. And the kids are shouting, right, through the whole thing. They're just yelling. None of us really want to hear that, <laughs> and, and it can be damaging to their voices. So I say this, sometimes I'll say, use your strongest voice, and, how, and where does our strength come from in our, for our singing voice? From our breath. So we have to work on breathing in order to get that. It's the power behind it. I compare it to, who? I compare it to, throwing the ball. And if they go, who? I'll say, uh-huh, you just threw that, um, that ball from here to there. And now we want to throw it from home plate to the, to the, um, to the who's that person, the pitcher. <laughs> you want to throw it all the way to the pitcher. So it takes more energy than that. So sometimes we'll even do this, whoo, to get the sound out. Whoo, to get that sound. And they'll all do that together. Um, singing has to be a habit. It has to be part of the church culture. Why do we have so many congregants who don't sing anymore? It bugs me. It's so joyful to sing. And, and that kind of refers to what I'm going to talk about in the next session, which is I think they think they would love singing canons and, and rounds in the congregation. Maybe right before worship starts, you come out or one of the choir directors comes out and teaches something to the whole congregation that they can sing maybe for a few weeks as the opening. Try it in the summer if that seems too casual, but I think it's really important for everybody to get an opportunity to sing. I wanted to let you know that I wrote something on G that I forgot to take out, 
and I've got and I've already written ah, right here okay. because I wrote um, some boys are really self-conscious about singing they think it's a girl thing and we talk about boys voices versus girl voices and talk about the fact that their voices are going to change well the thing is all their voices are changing mm -hmm. it's just that the boys voice change is more dramatic and here's the part I'm really sorry I didn't mark out and I would love it if y'all would mark it out but it says, I make a big deal out of telling them that they're lucky because they're going to have two different voices in their lifetime. That should say, because they're going to have a wider range of singing in their lifetime. I wrote this a long time ago, I can tell. And I said, use it before you lose it. No, mark that through. They're not going to lose it. Do you all know the name Henry Leck? Okay, Henry talks about the top-down approach, and he talks about continuing to sing. In the, you know, we used to call it the falsetto. Now a lot of people are calling it the male head voice. Because more and more men are continuing to warm up into their higher range and all the way into their lower range. So they could have like four octaves. And that is cool. Tell the guys, tell the boys, that's a really cool thing. And the more they sing in their, what we call falsetto, as their voice changes, the easier the change is going to be for their voices. So they need to keep uh, vocalizing them. So instead of the two different voices, you want us to put in something different? A wider range. A wider range. Wider range. So they're going to have a much wider range in their lifetime than the girls are. And just mark out use it before you lose it. They're never going to lose it. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to talk really fast about being a good vocal model and I, I think, first of all, it's really important to, to model with your voice instead of with the piano. So if you're teaching an anthem by rote, memorize it and be able to sing it like I did at the beginning so that you're singing the whole thing for them and then you break it down phrase by phrase while they look at the anthem. Or if it's by rote, if they don't have the music in front of them then, and you're teaching it just from memory, then uh, let them follow the phrase and sing each phrase. The best thing too is for them to be able to read some of it. So if you can put some of the notes on the board and let them read those notes and then find it in the music, that's always really good too. And I'm going to talk about that some in the whole reading session I'm going to tomorrow. About how you find, you isolate the place they can read and let them read that and everything else they can just learn by it. Beautiful way of starting on a certain note. Is there a range that's helpful to for for younger? Yeah. I'd say like preschool and I uh, preschool and middle and then okay. For preschool, you use the key of uh, D for warm up for sewing me. So A to F sharp, mm -hmm. and their range is about D to in, in kinder about D to A. Uh huh. Maybe C. Maybe up to C. And then they keep adding notes below and notes above as they get older. Okay. Okay. So by the time they're in fifth and sixth grades, they can sing an E flat pretty comfortably. The fourth space E flat pretty comfortably, and they can sing a B flat pretty comfortably below the below the staff. By fifth or sixth grade. But you want to keep the range. The keys of F and G are really really great for children's voices, and E flat, and D. You know. But um, usually the range needs to sit kind of in the middle. There was one more question. Um, I have heard that children, maybe a little bit in later elementary, really do very well, like E through G, even up there. And do you agree or disagree with that? You know, I worked with that fifth grade choir uh -huh. for a long time, and they were select. There were like three or four best kids from each school, fifth grade. And by the end of the year, they were 11 years old, and they could usually sing an E or an F pretty comfortably. Okay. G's are hard. Okay. I, I just think it's hard. I think, I think with church choir, look at E flats. And maybe if there's an, <coughs> F, an optional F at the end, you have a few children who can sing that. But the main thing is you want it to be open. You don't want it to be tight and pinched. So if they're going, ah, like that is not comfortable. Ah, if they can do that, and I'm not even warmed up right now, but if they can do that comfortably, 
then yes. But if they look strained and they're frowning, they're going, Groo, you know, it looks tight, then I'd say, wait on that. Okay. All right, we're going to do one more song unless you have another question. And we're going over it like five minutes because we started about five or six minutes late. Is that all right? Will there still be ice cream and, and Dr. Pepper? I hope. Okay. Just go get it. All right. So, um, you know what? Just, we're going to do that. Uh, tell me what you're thankful for song. This is an opportunity for kids to sing individually and using Psalm 9. I have the Bible open right now to Psalm 9. I think it's important for them to realize, oh, to make that connection between Sunday school, church, and choir to understand we use the book, the Bible also. In fact, we use it a lot. It's in almost every song we sing in church. So Psalm 9, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. So that's the first two verses. And it goes, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Okay, well, can you sing that with me, ready? I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell of all the wonderful deeds. And you can sing God's or you can sing your, whichever. We can sing God's in this case. One more time, ready? I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell And it's going to go like, tell me what you were thankful for. And you can sing, I'm thankful for parents. Or, I'm thankful for children. 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 Yep, we're pretty high right here, is okay? <laughs> I can go a little bit lower. I will give thanks to the Lord. I wrote it down, but we can change it if we need to. I will give thanks to Tell me what you were thankful for. Would everybody sing, I'm thankful for something together? Good, I like it. Ready? I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will tell about God's wonderful deeds. Can I get four people to tell us what you're thankful for? Four people who will sing by yourselves. So I'll just sing. Tell me what you're thankful for. I'm thankful for music. Tell me what you were thankful for. I'm thankful for our church. Two more. <clears throat> Tell me what you were thankful for. I'm thankful for Jesus. You know what? I did a recording with this piece, and that's what one of the little boys sang. And when you did that, it just brought back that memory. <laughs> Tell me what you're thankful for. I'm thankful for grandkids. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Good. Okay. So we're going to put it together. And the first time we'll have one, two. And the second time we'll have one, two. All right? Okay. So I'm just going to play through this once. And we'll all sing on the refrain. And I'll go, I'll be, let's see if I can do this. Well, 